In 1945, a German woman named Erna Bielhardt was arrested by Soviet soldiers on charges that she had been a concentration camp supervisor. The place in question was Stutthof, one of the cruelest detention centers of the Third Reich, where thousands of people suffered indescribable pain and met their end. The following year, Bielhardt, along with other women who also held various positions in the field, were brought to trial to determine her degree of responsibility. As witnesses filed past and gave their version of events, the public was stunned. It seemed incredible that women so young and harmless-looking should have committed crimes so savage that they would chill the blood of the most reckless. However, Bielhardt stressed over and over again that she had nothing to do with the crimes, that she had never hit anyone, much less murdered prisoners. In fact, according to her, she was just as shocked as the rest of the room to hear about the torture. Camp survivors confirmed these facts, although the court was not entirely convinced. For Bielhardt, it was a matter of life and death, within a few hours, the judges would decide the fate of each defendant and would make it known whether he was to be hanged or imprisoned. Do not move from your screen, because in the next few minutes we will tell you everything about the trial of the Stutthof guards. The Stutthof concentration camp was the first to be established outside the borders of Germany during World War II. It was built in Poland, in a region far from large urban centers, surrounded by swamps and forests. It officially opened its doors in September 1939, and in its beginnings it was thought of as a place to house the most important members of Polish society. The prisoners came from the economic, political and cultural elite of the country, so that political leaders, religious leaders, famous artists and highly prestigious intellectuals lived in their barracks. A year before its inauguration, the Nazis had drawn up lists of Poles considered dangerous who had to be arrested immediately. The underlying objective was to reorganize the country in the image and likeness of national socialist ideals, and the first step for this was to eliminate these subjects. Although Stutthof was supposed to house civilians, as a consequence of the war the Nazis also sent prisoners of war there. Within weeks of opening, there were already 6,000 people locked up, and the number grew as Germany deported Jews from conquered territories. The site had 40 subcamps, whose inmates were forced to do forced labor to supply the German military industry. Most of the slave workers had to attend a weapons factory daily to help in the production of war material. As in any concentration camp, the living conditions in Stutthof were deplorable. Over the years that it worked, an estimated 110,000 people passed through it. More than half of that total died from the spread of diseases such as typhus or from lack of basic food. Those who were weakened by hunger were selected by the guards to die in the gas chambers, since they were not fit for forced tasks. Most of those executed in this way were Jewish women and children, who spent their last seconds of life inhaling the Zyklon B poison. Among all the crimes that occurred inside the Stutthof, Perhaps the most chilling is the rumor that the SS used the corpses to extract their body fat and make soaps. Although this was never fully confirmed, it has been proven that the Nazis in the camp subjected the inmates to terrible torture. At the beginning of 1945, when the Third Reich was on the verge of defeat, the leaders of Stutthof organized the evacuation of the camp. Thousands of exhausted, starving and sick prisoners were forced to walk hundreds of miles to get away from the Allies. According to specialists, 25,000 people died in this process. When the Soviets liberated the camp on May 9, 1945, they found no more than 100 survivors, those who hid from the Nazis to avoid forced marches. Following the surrender of Germany, the Allies rounded up what few Stutthof personnel they could find, there were 72 SS officers and 6 female supervisors. In 1946 the trial began, and the survivors declared the torture to which they had been subjected by the Nazi women. They were Jenny Barkman, Elizabeth Becker, Wanda Klaff, Eva Paradies, Gerda Steinhardt and Erna Bielhardt, who we told you about at the beginning of the video. Those who witnessed the sessions later stated that the defendants did not seem interested in what was said about them. In fact, Barkman was seen absently fixing her hair, smiling and flirting with the guards who were watching her. 
The only one who was nervous was Erna Bielhart, who said the following, I was affiliated with the National Socialist Party since 1933, I like the Führer's idea that we would be a dominant nation, but I never liked my job, the prisoners were tormented too much. I had to look the other way. In fact, she resigned six weeks after being appointed camp supervisor, after which she dedicated herself to tending wounded soldiers. After much doubt, the judges decided to spare her life and sentence her to five years in prison. The case of the other women, however, was very different, since the witnesses assured that they were in charge of selecting those who would die in the gas chambers. One of them, Wanda Claff, proudly acknowledged it, I am very intelligent and I have always been brilliant in my work. I beat at least two prisoners a day. One survivor stated the following about defendant Ava Paradis, once, she ordered a group of inmates to strip naked in the middle of the snow, and she showered us with ice-cold water. If any of them moved, she would beat us up. The evidence was abundant and the brutality evident, so the court sentenced the five Studhoff supervisors to death by hanging. The date of the executions was set for July 4, 1946, and the place chosen was a hill near the city of Gdansk, in Poland. That day, a crowd of 20,000 people gathered to witness the death of the monsters that had caused so much pain. A scaffold was not set up, but it was decided to put a rope around their necks, pass it through a post and tie it to the back of a truck. Once the vehicle moved forward, the women would remain slightly suspended in the air for the minutes necessary for them to be strangled to death. The first executed was Jenny Barkman, whose last words were these, life is a pleasure, and that is why it ends quickly. The audience watched as her body rose, the knot wrapped around her throat, her feet pounding in a frantic rhythm. When she stood still, it was the turn of the others, who passed one by one towards their final destination. The bodies were left hanging there, so that the next convicts would have a clear view of what awaited them. Not only the five women from Studhoff were killed, but also six other male guards who had tortured prisoners. This is how the victims of the concentration camp found some justice for the horrors to which they were subjected by Nazism. In April 1945, the BBC broadcast a report that chilled the blood of television viewers. The story in question had its origin in Germany, in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, which was one of the most important of the Third Reich. Journalists had recorded the moment when Allied troops arrived at the site and found thousands of bodies piled up on the ground, unburied, rotting in the open. In a quavering voice, the BBC announcer described the scene as follows, Here, on this piece of land, lie the dead and dying, the living resting their heads on the corpses. Among them move emaciated people who look like ghosts, who haven't eaten for months, walking aimlessly, with their eyes lost on the horizon. Babies were born in this place, but these poor creatures had no chance of surviving in these conditions. A maddened mother yelled at our English soldiers to give her a bottle of milk for her child, but the child in question had been dead for days in his crib. Rarely had the British population encountered such horror. Immediately, they began to wonder who was responsible for this barbarity and when they would have to pay the consequences. The answer to these questions came a few months later, when the Allies arrested Bergen-Belsen's commanding personnel and put them on trial. It was then that the truth came out, many of the murders had been committed by young women affiliated with Nazism. Beneath the apparent innocence of his youth, lurked monsters capable of subjecting prisoners to hell. Do not move from your screen because in the next few minutes we'll tell you the story of these women and the punishment they received for their crimes. The Bergen-Belsen camp opened its doors in 1940 in northern Germany, and in its beginnings it was designed to contain prisoners of war from the Allied countries. However, shortly after the SS took control of the site and decided to modify its functions. From this moment on, it began to house Jews, political opponents of Nazism, gypsies, and Slavs. Inside the camp, the different groups were divided according to their origin, so that the Jews were separated into one camp for those who came from Poland, another for those from the Netherlands, and another for those of Hungarian descent. The same criteria was used to divide the other communities. As in all concentration centers, 
the inmates were forced to perform forced labor to help German industry. In the case of Bergen-Belsen, they had to work as slaves in a leather recycling factory, where each person was given shoes from which the reusable material had to be removed. In August 1944, the establishment began to receive women. Thousands of young people, adults, and old women were confined inside, and it is known that in Frank found her end here. The female population of the camp was subjected to the same deplorable conditions as the male. Most of the problems were caused by overcrowding, Bergen-Belsen was full, and there was no room to accommodate more people. This, however, was not an inconvenience for the Nazi hierarchs, who did not care about the comfort of the prisoners and even enjoyed seeing them suffer. Soon the food available to the inmates ran out, and those who did not die of malnutrition were stricken with terrible diseases. Dysentery, typhus, and tuberculosis spread among the prisoners and decimated their numbers. Faced with the catastrophe, the reaction of the Nazi guards was to execute the inmates, with the aim of eliminating the human surplus and restoring balance. In April 1945, with Nazi Germany almost defeated, British troops arrived at the Bergen-Belsen camp. As we told you at the beginning of the video, when they entered they found 13,000 unburied bodies and 60,000 inmates starving and on the verge of death. The staff who managed the establishment were arrested and taken into custody until, five months later, the trial began to determine who had been guilty of the crimes committed there. Beginning in September 1945, dozens of SS members were questioned by prosecutors. Those who witnessed the event were shocked to see that those responsible for a large part of the crimes were young women. One of them was Irma Grease, just 22 years old, who had earned the nicknames the Beast of Belsen and the Hyena of Auschwitz. Grease had worked as a prison guard in several concentration camps, and in all of them she displayed the same sociopathic behavior. She was personally in charge of choosing those destined for the gas chambers, and on occasion she beat defenseless inmates to death with her bare hands. One of her favorite pastimes was to unleash hungry dogs on her victims, who were torn to pieces by the animals. Another of Bergen-Belsen's prominent torturers was Elizabeth Volkenrath, 26, who had commanded the women's section of Auschwitz in her record. She liked to play with the lives of the prisoners, whom she subjected to torture, beatings, and executions. According to certain witnesses, she had gone so far as to kill an old woman by pushing her down a staircase. Among the defendants in the trial, there was also Johanna Bormann, known as the Woman of the Dogs, since she shared the same passion as Irma Grease for letting the inmates be devoured by her dogs. The jury ruled that the crimes were so heinous that they deserved the death penalty. Ten other SS guards, however, were sentenced to prison, as there was insufficient evidence against them. On December 13, 1945, the scaffold was prepared for Greece, Volkenrath, and Bormann to take their last steps. The person in charge of the execution was Albert Pierrepoint, a professional executioner who had the habit of interviewing the sentenced and taking their body measurements, to calculate the exact length of the rope that was to hang them. In his memoirs, Pierre Point gives details of what the meeting with each of the women was like. Her brief moment with Irma Grease went as follows, when we opened her cell, she came up to us laughing. She looked like the type of girl you want to date. She answered all the questions I asked her, but when I wanted to know how old she was, she kept quiet and looked at me with a knowing smile. At that moment I realized that asking a woman how old she is was awkward and impolite, although she finally answered. After taking her measurements, at 9.34 in the morning, she entered the execution room and walked to the center of her scaffold. There was a chalk mark indicating where she should stand. We put a white hood over her head and wound the noose around her neck. The last thing Irma said was Schnell, which in German means fast. The trap opened and within a few minutes, the doctor pronounced her dead. Thirty minutes later it was the turn of Elizabeth Volkenrath, who until the last minute denied having participated in the crimes of Bergen-Belsen or having any knowledge of the Holocaust. At 10.04 in the morning the gallows did their duty and broke Volkenratha's neck. Half an hour later, the guards led Johanna Bormann to her scaffold. The woman was 52 years old and her health was failing, as she limped noticeably. 
The last thing she said before she died was, I have feelings too. This is how the story of these women came to an end, who went down in history as the cruelest of the Third Reich. Although the victims could in no way be compensated for their suffering, the sentences served to show them that there was still justice in the world. I remember one of the guards, Dorothea Binns, walking through the camp. I can still see her before my eyes. The day when an exhausted prisoner passed by her, stumbled, and fell is etched in my memory. With great effort, she got up and staggered away. Such a scene was enough for Dorothea, who called the dogs and set them upon the helpless inmate. They were wild, fierce beasts, trained specifically to tear apart the victim until they ceased to breathe. This is the testimony of Olga Golovina, a survivor of Ravensbrück, a concentration camp notable for being exclusively for women. Here the female guards had free reign to indulge their darkest impulses. The result was an array of aberrant tortures, ranging from simple yet forceful beatings to dismemberment with axes. Eventually the bloodbath came to an end with the conclusion of the Second World War, and those responsible for the atrocities received their just punishment. Today, in this new episode of Military History, we will tell you all about the executions of the guards of Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück began official operations in May 1939. Its construction was ordered by Heinrich Himmler, the leader of the SS, to have a place to house the female population. The camp was located in northern Germany, just 90 kilometers from the city of Berlin. Initially, around 2,000 women accused of opposing Hitler's regime were imprisoned there, among whom was a group of 50 Jehovah's Witnesses. They had been arrested for distributing propaganda, claiming that the Fuhrer was the incarnation of the Antichrist. Their audacity had cost them their freedom. Other prisoners included communists and former members of the Reichstag, the German parliament, although not only political enemies of Nazism were taken there. Prostitutes, gypsies, criminals, and homosexuals were also considered dangerous to German society and therefore were sent to the camp. The population of the facility increased to the point that just eight months after the start of the Second World War, its maximum capacity had already been exceeded. The inmates lived crowded in dirty barracks, dressed in rags starved and ravaged by diseases. So let's hear the testimony of Anise Postvenet, who was sent to Ravensbrück for being part of the French resistance. She remembers her first impression upon entering the site. Seeing those disfigured gray women with vacant stares scared us. Suddenly, we felt that we were entering a zone of death. On the other hand, the site was notable for the fact that there were 150 female guards whose job was to supervise the inmates and ensure that they maintained order. Like in other concentration camps, the guards were trained to rid themselves of their feelings. They had to harden their hearts and see the prisoners as beasts to whom no mercy should be shown. A survivor of the camp describes it this way, they didn't shoot the women, instead they aimed to make us die of sorrow, hunger, and exhaustion. When we arrived at Ravensbrook, the first thing I saw was a cart full of stacked corpses, their arms and legs hung outward, and they had their eyes and mouths open in a grimace of horror. They dehumanized us. We felt that even cattle had more value than us. The guards were not only complicit in everything that happened there, but often directly responsible for the abuses. One of the most hated was Emma Zimmer, who began working in the camp in 1939, shortly after its opening. She was one of those responsible for selecting the women who would go to the gas chambers, which made her the target of hatred from the inmates. A survivor remembers her as follows. She was a wicked old SS accustomed to frightening us with her threats. With her sadistic tone of voice, she would say things like, for example, I will report you and then you will go far away. Do you know where? You will be ash in the chimney. We feared her and at the same time detested her. Another guard was Greta Boozel, known for her absolute lack of empathy with the prisoners. On one occasion she was heard saying the following, if any of the prisoners are too tired to work, they should be sent to rot. Interestingly, 
She had studied to be a nurse and help others, but fate led her to work in a concentration camp where her task was to prepare women to die poisoned with the lethal gas Ziklon B. However, the most hated guard in Ravensbrück was Dorothea Benz, a woman whose cruelty exceeded all imaginable limits. She entered the camp for the first time in 1939 after volunteering to work in the kitchen. At that time, she was 21 years old, and no one suspected that a young woman with such an innocent appearance would become a true monster. In late summer 1940, she was promoted to the position of subdirector of a cell block, which meant that the inmates were at her disposal. It was at that moment that she unleashed her cruelest side and acquired the taste for savagely beating the prisoners until they were on the brink of death. In 1944, her inhumanity was rewarded with a new promotion, this time to the position of Oberaufseherin, meaning chief supervisor of the concentration camp. Her power was absolute, and although she had other direct superiors she had to obey, the truth is that she was allowed to do as she pleased. Dorothea would inspect the prisoners twice a day. The women had to line up in the courtyard for hours without being able to move, regardless of whether it was sweltering hot, bitterly cold, pouring rain, or they were exhausted from hunger. They couldn't speak, sit, look at each other, and certainly not gaze upon the guards. The process lasted a couple of hours until every inmate had been called by name to confirm their presence and prove that none had escaped. The photograph you are currently seeing shows Dorothea in her work uniform, standing next to her gigantic German Shepherd. The dog was trained to attack at the signal of the supervisor, something that, as we saw at the beginning of the video, happened frequently. Bins had little patience for those who broke the rules no matter how insignificant the infraction. A woman with improperly fastened clothes, or who accidentally dropped a crust of bread to the ground, could receive dozens of lashes as punishment. Dorothea used to walk with a whip in one hand scanning the prisoners from head to toe, looking for any excuse to strike them. Next, we will hear the testimony of Dagmar Haikova, a Czech survivor of Ravensbrück, who witnessed one of the supervisor's most brutal crimes. Dorothea noticed a woman she thought wasn't working hard enough. She approached her and slapped her to the ground. Then she took an ax and started hacking at the inmate until her lifeless body was nothing but a bloody mass. When she finished, Dorothea wiped her shiny boots with a dry piece of the corpse's skirt. She mounted her bicycle and pedaled back to her quarters unhurriedly as if nothing had happened. The guards continued to behave like angels of death throughout the war, although their reign of terror was approaching its catastrophic end. In the spring of 1945, as the Third Reich was cornered, the Red Army of the Soviet Union launched a sweeping advance into German territory. On April 30th of that year, they reached Ravensbrück and liberated the 3,000 survivors who were still imprisoned there. In the following weeks, the camp guards were identified and arrested by the Allies. Immediately, a trial against them began. Evidence of their crimes was collected, and witnesses who could testify to the abuses were sought. Greta Bosel and Emma Zimmer, whom we mentioned earlier, were found guilty of committing war crimes related to the mistreatment of prisoners. They were executed by hanging on May 3, 1947, and September 20, 1948, respectively. The fate of Dorothea Binz, the all-powerful supervisor of the concentration camp, would not be much different. In April 1945, upon learning that the Soviets were approaching her position, she decided to escape on her own. She was aware that if the Russians caught her, she could consider herself dead, so she risked everything in a desperate escape. She only made it to Hamburg, where she was quickly identified by a patrol of the British Army and taken into custody. The trial against Dorothea and other officers of Ravensbrück lasted two years, and in the end, the former supervisor was sentenced to death by hanging. What you are seeing now is the filmed record of the moment when the accused heard their final sentence. There, identified with a sign bearing the number five was Binz. In April 1947, while awaiting death, Dorothea attempted suicide by cutting her veins. However, she was saved by the guards who intervened just in time to prevent her from escaping justice. 
On May 2nd of that year, she was led to the gallows, where she was forced to stand on the trap door. A black hood was placed over her face and the noose was tightened around her neck. Then, the executioner activated the mechanism, Dorothea Binns fell through the hole, and her neck broke instantly. Thus, the story of the torturers of Ravensbrück reached its grim conclusion. We have reached the end of the video. Please leave your comments in the comment section below, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that have left their mark on history.